Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia, but today I'm actually on the Gold Coast, still in Australia, at Low Carb Down Under. Yeah. And I've been on a ketogenic diet since April of 2014. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've lost about 100 pounds. I've completely turned my health around. In this show is a document of our experiences thriving for years in nutritional ketosis. Yeah, and reversing diabetes. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah! <laughs> Hooga! <laughs> we have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we share those studies that we found in the show notes. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Mm. We love to cook and we love to eat. Yep. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that's, okay, can't be ignored. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, I'll say it. Can't mm -hmm. be ignored. All right, so let's start podcast number 139, Cardiologist Nadir Ali on Cholesterol. Could you say you're due for a little? So, Richard, do we have any apologies or corrections from last week's show? Let's see. Last week's show was 138. That's Ovo Lactober. <laughs> um, I, I'm apologizing to my own body for st <laughs> deciding to do this stupid thing. <laughs> oh, man. Really? I ended up not eating fish at all. I, I think the first time I had fish was last night at the speaker dinner uh, at the Gold Coast Conference because uh, it was the only source of protein. There was no eggs. All of the vegetables were pretty low protein sources. And so, oh. you know, just, just to have some protein in my diet, uh, I had some delicious salmon. So, you know, nice. that's, that's not really – that's almost a vegetable, isn't it? <laughs> uh, oh, come on. Salmon's delicious. I love salmon. <laughs> it is. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I've got no apologies for the show. All right. Well, let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is. Well, I'm actually this time I'm actually going to get it straight from the horse's mouth. Okay. I've just spoken with Stephen Finney uh, <laughs> in my in my room. We've just uh, we've just recorded some uh, content for a future show, and he tells me that a ketogenic diet, and considering he invented the the nutritional ketogenic diet, right? He says a ketogenic diet is less than fifty grams of carbohydrates, and for some people who are insulin resistant, it could be less than thirty grams. Hmm. Carl and I have to have less than 20, but, yeah. and he says it's, it's a moderate protein diet. It's not a high protein diet. Right. And he says that it is fat to satiety. And, uh, and so it, what happens is when you start the diet, uh, you start eating a lot of fat and then eventually your appetite goes and you eat less fat because you're getting fat from your body. Right. Then spontaneously, you slowly increase the amount of fat on your plate as your body fat gives up its reserves, but you always eat ad libitum. And this is the unique thing about the ketogenic diet. It is to satiety, unlike any other weight loss diet in the world. To satiety, thou shalt eat fat. fat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I think we've triggered everybody now. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> if you're just starting, listen to our starting keto show at start com. And I cannot wait to listen to your interview with Stephen Finney. It's great. It's a oh, coup so to have him on our <laughs> silly little show. Yeah, Tim Noakes, Gary Fetke, and Steve Finney. In fact, Gary Fetke I recorded from exactly the same room this time last year. So wow, excellent. <laughs> Well, I, I want to hear all about your week. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> so I've been at uh, I've been at the Gold Coast, and I went first to low carb Sydney on Thursday, and that was a presentation by Professor Jake Kushner, who is an endocrinologist in America, works in Texas, and mm -hmm. also a presentation by Professor Stephen Finney, and also a, a presentation from. Paul Mason, who we, we know well. He That's right. He came to speak at KetoFest. Yeah. So that was an awesome presentation. Uh, and then uh, it turned out that Paul actually had lost his voice. Mm. And he was supposed to be doing the MC 
event. And I, I just showed up to this event as just, a, you know, I paid me 30 bucks. I sit in the back <laughs> and I watch. And, <laughs> and so Jessica Turton actually came up to me and said, Paul's lost his voice. Do you think you could come down and MC? So I just jumped on stage and did my shtick. Oh, good. <laughs> so, good. So there you go. And then, um, and then flew up to the Gold Coast and, uh, it, we're currently on Sunday at the, that this is the last day of the conference and we're on a lunch break. So I'm taking the opportunity to record this podcast now. Fantastic. So that was my week. How was yours, Carl? Wow. That sounds mm-hmm. great. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been watching your Facebook pictures and stuff and it looks like you're having way too good of a time. <laughs> <laughs> What's awesome. wrong with that? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. No, yeah, not at all. Exactly. exactly. I uh, I had a great week. The highlight of my week, but you know, I've been doing this um, uh, c- the keto fixer, and I'm basically putting together yeah. a pilot for what I hope will be a documentary. And mm. I'm following these people as they go through their keto journeys, and one of them made a breakthrough this week, and uh, I'm just really excited about that. But the big news is mm. a smoked leg of lamb. Isn't that good? This was a 20-pound <laughs> leg of lamb, my friend. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, and you you had that at the VIP party when, when I cooked it in my smoker. That's so right. How, how was it in your smoker? Well, I did a bone-in leg of lamb, and I used Moroccan mm-hmm. spices this time. Okay. I, I didn't nice. use any rosemary, but I had mm-hmm. cumin and cinnamon and garlic and paprika and uh, um, all sorts of great aromatic spices. And I even put a little yeah. sweet in it. I even put a little allulose in there. But I also had okay. hot pepper, um, mm-hmm. just really delicious stuff. And I smoked it for 10 hours between 180 Fahrenheit and 200 Fahrenheit. And it came out to a perfect 140 medium rare. And it was so mm-hmm. delicious. I had my friend Gosh. over... Uh, for dinner and my recipe today is actually a hummus that i made from roasted cauliflower that will blow you away good i look forward to being blown away (laughs) i had a great week so let's give Mm -hmm. away some swag my friend yeah every show we pick a lucky winner at random for the members of the two keto dudes fan club and today we're giving away a treasure trove of stuff from vendors we like all of which you can find at fanclub.2keto.com We should also mention that most of our vendors can only ship inside the United States. Right. But if we happen to pick someone outside the United States, we will find something to send you, but it probably won't be the treasure trove until we can find some affordable means of distribution. So who's our winner this week? Today's winner is Christine Cipiora. Congratulations, Christine. Yeah. Let's tell everybody what she's won. Right. Well, the first thing we're giving away is a Two Keto Dudes coffee mug that says, Keep Calm and Keto One, and it also has our mugs on it. Mm-hmm. And a signed copy of Lies My Doctor Told Me by Dr. Ken Berry. That's online at lies.2keto.com. And a bottle of Stevia Sweet Barbecue Sauce, online at steviasweetbbq.com. We also have a cheese-making kit from Wine & Way. That's from Pam Zorn. She's the one who gave everybody at Keto Fest a kit to make their own fresh mozzarella. Oh, yeah. Well, she sells these kits online at wineandway.com. That's W-I-N-E-A-N-D-W-H-E-Y.com. And a six-ounce cup of beef bone broth concentrate from Birthright Nutrition. Just to add water, heat, stir, sip, and enjoy. Jam-packed with good stuff online at birthrightnutrition.com. We're also giving away a bottle of Remag Magnesium Solution, developed by Dr. Carolyn Dean, along with a copy of her protocol, and the Keto and Magnesium Manifesto that's online at magmiracle.com. We're also giving away a big bottle of Fasting Drops from Keto Chow. It's a well-formulated blend of electrolytes. You just drop a little in your water, and fasting is a breeze. Online at fastingdrops.2keto.com. And two bottles of Sated, one chocolate, one vanilla, online at sated.2keto.com. And from Keto & Co., a sampler six-pack, a bag of brownies, four bags of different flavored cauliflower rice, and a bag of flatbread, online at ketoand.co. And if you don't want to wait to win some swag, you can buy all sorts of it online at gear.2keto.com. Absolutely. Congratulations, Christine. And we'll get that stuff right out to you. And now I think it's time for us to read some... Mail! <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> what you got, Carl? All right. Well, I'm continuing to read from the great big public keto before and after thread in the ketogenic forums. This one's from Amon. 
And he says, I've been meaning to post on here for ages, if only to pay back some small way for the help and support I've received from the two keto dudes and the wider low carb community. I've struggled with my weight from childhood and have been a yo-yo dieter for 30 years with some successes, but always ending up heavier than the last time once I take my eye off the diet ball. Mm -hmm. As most of us know only too well, calorie restriction is relentlessly hard to maintain as a lifestyle. Yep. Yep, sure is. He says, I have come very close to losing my pilot's license numerous times due to my weight, blood pressure, cholesterol, and all that, which would have deprived me of my career. I was probably pre-diabetic too, but I don't have any blood records. I discovered low carb in March 2017 when I weighed at least 20 stones or 280 pounds, 127 kilos. I was too scared and embarrassed to step on the scale. After a few weeks of low-carb, high-fat, I switched to full keto, and I've mostly stayed in ketosis ever since. By February 2018, I was down to 15 stone, which is 218 pounds or 99K. Eight months later, and the weight has stayed off. It varies between 93 and 100 kilograms, and I would like to lose another 10, ideally, but that's kilograms. Mm -hmm. But I already feel so much fitter and happier. Keto has given me the control I have never had before. Three-day fasts are a breeze, and I can cycle 100 miles in a fasted state, no problem. I won't nice. be going back to eating carbs. Mm -hmm. I love talking about the keto way of life with friends and colleagues, and a number of them have taken it up too. Once again, a big shout out to the two keto dudes and all the other rock stars of the keto community. You are saving lives every day. And yeah, big shout out to everybody else. I mean, you know, we didn't invent this stuff. We're just a megaphone. Yeah. We didn't. But I did speak to the guy today who did. <laughs> and I told him, we're paying <laughs> it forward. And Eamon, that's your job. Go out and find somebody who needs help and pay it forward. Absolutely. And he's already doing it. That's my mail. What do you got? So mine is also from the forum. This is from Judy. And Judy says, this is not really related to the podcast, but she says, I started on August 11th, 2018. My birthday. That's your birthday, yeah. And today it is September the 20th, 2018. Well, that's a week away from my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she says, I started the podcast and I'm only on paying it back. I love you guys. My blood pressure was 152 over 102 when I started. Yesterday I had it taken and it was 132 over 82. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've lost 20 pounds. That's also good. Awesome. Uh, I've also had a few slips with beer, but I got right back on the horse. I love this way of eating because it works and it's easy. I know that some people are struggling with parts, but I just listen to the podcast and it grounds me. You guys mm. are awesome. Keep up the great work. I'm going to live to see adult grandchildren. Love, and I mean love, Judy from Portland, Oregon. How cool is that? And Judy, you are welcome. Go pay it forward. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's that's been our motto, right? Pay it forward, pay yeah. it back. Whatever yep. you're going to do, yep. just go help somebody else. If everybody helps yep. two other people, before you know it, we're going to we're going to run out of diabetics. That's that's the plan. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely the plan. All right, so I'm going to play a recording that I did actually earlier today while you were in a in a session in the Gold Coast with Dr. Nadir Ali. And he's a cardiologist. He's been a cardiologist since 1990. Yeah. And he's been an interventional cardiologist, meaning that he's performed stent surgery on many patients yeah. after they've suffered a heart attack. He's mm -hmm. right in there, you know. Mm. And uh, uh, credentials-wise, his fellowship was sponsored by the American Heart Association. And for seven years, he was on the teaching faculty of Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. So let's roll the interview with Dr. Nadir. Ali. And I have Dr. Nadir Ali on the line on Skype. Hi, Nadir. Hey, Carl. How are you? I am doing really good. Had an hour of bike ride this morning uh, before this call, so that kind of relaxes me. Uh, I actually did a cheese run. I went to the local Kroger shop and got some cheese right from around where you live. Oh, really? From Vermont? Yeah, from Vermont. It's called Cremont. It's made from goat, sheep, and cow milk. Wow. Yeah, they have a lot of good cheese up there. Fact, I'm driving up that way today to see the fall foliage. It's peaking in New Hampshire, Vermont. Up near Hanover is where I'm headed. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, first of all, I was blown away by your talk at Keto Fest. Oh, thank you. I mean, you don't find too many cardiologists talking about how, you know, we we think we understand lipids, but we don't. And have a steak. <laughs> uh, it's just uh, goes against conventional wisdom. And we've been talking about cholesterol on the show for a long time. But w- one of the things I really liked about your talk, and we can go over some of it now, is you emphasized how important cholesterol is as a substance that we need in our body for basic life function. And we can't dismiss that. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think uh, life is not possible without cholesterol. It is part of our cell membrane, which is the part of our cell that protects the cell. It is important for cognitive function. The very fact that I'm able to talk to you and think is because the cholesterol is important in the structure and function of neurotransmission, which is brain signaling. Mm. I wouldn't be also able to deal with the stress of any situation if cholesterol was not supplying the raw materials to my adrenal glands to make stress hormones, the stress hormones that make a, make it easy for us to deal with day-to-day stress. Mm. I also talked about how important cholesterol is, specifically the LDL cholesterol in supplying raw materials to our gonads so that we will have our sexual differentiations. Yeah. Our sex life would not be possible without it. Yeah, kind of important. (laughs) Yeah, I would agree with that. And finally, if we want to kind of round it up a little bit, our muscle function is dependent on cholesterol because the CoQ10, which is an important part of muscle function, comes from the same pathway that makes cholesterol. Now, you mentioned LDL cholesterol. But LDL is a protein that contains cholesterol, right? You meant the cholesterol inside an LDL particle as opposed to what? That's absolutely right. And and I think that you need to understand lipoproteins to understand cholesterol metabolism a little bit better. And since cholesterol is a fatty substance and since our blood is watery, cholesterol does not dissolve in blood. So the way our body transports the cholesterol or triglycerides, which is fat for that matter, is to package it into a particle, a lipoprotein particle, so that it can dissolve in blood and the specific lipoprotein imparts it certain functions. These are key identifying molecules that let the lipoprotein do biological functions. Like, for example, the LDL can participate in tissue repair. So, I want to just put this on hold for a minute because right here, right there, what you just said, that blood is water-based, triglycerides, fat-soluble vitamins, and cholesterol are all lipids. They're all fats. So, that right there just is basic science that refutes the whole clogging of the arteries you know, paradigm that we've been told for years and years and years, you know, don't eat saturated fat because it's going to block your arteries like a, like a, you know, like, like when you pour fat down a drain pipe, it's going to stick to the edges and you're going to have to use liquid plumber to come and clean it out. I I couldn't agree more. I think um, the whole paradigm that specifically LDL cholesterol is bad is slowly crumbling based on a lot of new information that the low-carb community and many different researchers from around the world are gathering. Yeah. And I'm not sure why the LDL took such a strong hold in our treatment modality uh, about 30, 40 years ago. Probably part of the reason was is that we discovered a pharmacologic molecule that could dramatically reduce the LDL. Mm. And I don't know if it is because of that we went down the wrong pathway and some very good people, very honest people are not able to dissociate themselves from a traditional way of thinking. Is part of the problem maybe that oxidized LDL 
is a problem, but only because it's oxidized, not because it's LDL? It is possible because uh, injury, uh, inflammation, oxidation is probably the primary factor giving rise to chronic diseases like vascular diseases. But to just kind of take oxidized LDL as the problem is to ignore a lot of lipoprotein metabolism and the way it is regulated. So I think that before you go and say it's oxidized LDL, you should have a little bit of an idea as to how the body uses these lipoproteins to do certain key functions. Okay. Let's unpack that a little bit. Yeah. So when you unpack that, you got to unpack it a little carefully because there are two pathways through which the lipoproteins start. One of them is through our gut. When we eat fat, you package the fat that you have eaten into lipoprotein molecules called chylomicrons. And the liver also puts out lipoprotein molecules, which is called very low density lipoproteins, otherwise VLDL. Yeah. So if you look at the way these molecules are cleared from the bloodstream is that our body does not like to have a lot of fat energy hanging in the bloodstream. Just like it does not like to have a lot of sugar hanging in the bloodstream, it wants to take the fat that you have eaten and either use it for energy or pack it into the fat cells. Right. So you should see a clearing of the fat that you have eaten through chylomicrons in the bloodstream rather quickly. And similarly, if the liver is putting out fat energy into the bloodstream like VLDL, it should also be cleared rapidly. Now, why does the liver put the LDL in the bloodstream in the first place? So the liver is a master metabolic regulator that is key in supplying energy in different ways. So one of the ways in which it supplies energy is by regulating sugar metabolism, glucose right. metabolism. And the other way is by regulating lipid metabolism. But the important concept that I think people should understand is that our body in a natural state in which it is not dysregulated will have low levels of sugar and low levels of uh, triglycerides or fat energy floating around in the bloodstream. And it's only when this is dysregulated is when you get into a problem. So like if I were to give an example of a person eating a standard American diet, uh, all kinds of carbohydrates, both simple and complex, mm. and a fair amount of fat, let's say about 35% fat. What is happening in them is that they're using the carbohydrate for fuel, but they're also getting insulin resistant. And over time, their fat cells become very full. Right. And when their fat cells become full, they leave a lot of chylomicron remnants, which is the fat you have eaten in the bloodstream, and you can measure that. And they also leave a lot of VLDL, which is the father of the LDL in the bloodstream as triglycerides, which is also something that you can measure. Mm. And surprisingly, these are the very individuals in whom the LDL is not high. Now, LDL is considered to be the bad cholesterol. But when you have high levels of VLDL, the father of LDL, it has not converted to LDL yet because it's not been able to drop off the triglyceride cargo. It's only when the VLDL is dropping off the triglyceride, the fat cargo, that it becomes the LDL cholesterol. So paradoxically, a person who is insulin resistant, pre-diabetic or diabetic will have low LDL levels and high amount of fat energy floating in the bloodstream 
has chylomicron remnants and VLDL particles. And I think that is the true disease state that we need to address. Yeah, it's just not as simple as you have too much LDL, certainly, and not even as simple as you have oxidized LDL. I couldn't agree more because this way of thinking, the way we are led to believe that LDL is bad, is preventing us from looking at a lot of contradictory evidence that shows that LDL has a purpose. It has a biologic role. That there are several studies based on biochemical studies as well as population-based studies that show that having high LDL could actually be beneficial for you. You got to give credit to some of the giants in this field. One of them is uh, Dr. Ravenskov, and I don't know if I pronounce his name right. Do you know of him? No. I mean, I may have read a study, but the name isn't ringing a bell. So he is one of the primary uh, uh, physicians out of Netherlands, along with Dr. Malcolm Kendrick from Scotland. Him I know. Yes. So they, these two have worked together. They have several papers together. Both of them have beautiful books that I think every cardiologist and every person taking a statin should read. And they have population-based studies in more than 65,000 patients in whom they have clearly demonstrated that after age 50, a person with high LDL cholesterol is not only at lower risk of total mortality, that is all-cause death, but also at lower risk of cardiovascular mortality. Yeah. I, when we interviewed Asim Malhotra uh, last year, I believe it was, he talked about that same study, I believe. Yes. And it's a study that I think is largely ignored by the medical profession because we are so focused in thinking that we need to drop everybody's LDL. It is so tightly ingrained in our thought process, isn't it? That even people like Richard and I, who know based on science that the LDL is sort of a meaningless number when, you know, when you look at it on a lipid panel, and I don't mean completely meaningless, but it isn't the demon that, you know, as you're saying, it isn't the demon we think it is. We still, we still, even us, we still say, and my cholesterol's good, you know, because we're conditioned to low LDL means good. I, I couldn't agree more. How do we get over that? There are a couple of factors that everybody needs to recognize. And one of them is that there is a significant paradox between LDL and insulin resistance. So, uh, you could also use the word oxymoron because... What'd you call me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It is an oxymoron. It, it's a paradox. It's true and false at the same time. If I can use an analogy, and that is that what advice that medical professionals give is that you should be on a low-fat diet. And by the way with the new information that sugar is bad, you should also be on a low-carb diet. Right. So it's an oxymoron to say that you can be on a low-fat, low-carb diet because there is not such a thing. If you're going to do that, you're going to eat protein and drink alcohol, and that's it. <laughs> right. And of course, you know that we cannot eat uh, more than a certain amount of protein. Right. And probably alcohol is one of the worst carbohydrate possible except and reasonable doses. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that any strategy that is designed to reduce your LDL will have to entail a very large carbohydrate consumption. And that over a period of time can lead to insulin resistance. Yeah. So we need to unpack that a little bit because people are going to take offense to that. So people say, hey, I'm going to eat a complex carbohydrate diet. And a complex carbohydrate diet is going to keep me insulin sensitive. It's not going to raise my insulin levels. It's also going to keep my LDL levels down. And that is the best way for me to live. Now you're talking about a low-fat plant-based diet, right? Correct. And I think that 
humans are not designed to consume a large amount of fiber. Now, there are many other people who are much smarter than I am who can talk about it because when you eat a a very heavy fiber diet, which would be a plant-based complex carbohydrate diet, you are doing a lot of wrong things. One is that you're going to poop several times a day. Hmm. And I'm not sure if that's the right thing to do. (laughs) The second thing is that the fiber is going to dilute out your stomach acid. And so your protein absorption is not going to be as good. Hmm. And the third thing is that the biologic value of plant-based protein is not as good as animal-based protein. And lastly, if you go into the hypothesis, which is called the expensive tissue hypothesis, we are designed to eat a large caloric dense food and not have to process it as much because our digestive tracts have evolved to absorb a lot of nutrients without having to process it. Mm -hmm. And so we need to eat calorie-dense food. And if you're eating calorie-dense, carbohydrate-rich food, it inevitably is going to lead to insulin resistance. Sure. And insulin resistance then gets back to my primary point, which is that when you have insulin resistance, your LDL levels are actually low. And you would think, by God, I am doing good. I'm immune from heart disease. Right. Whereas you are doing everything to increase your heart disease risks because you're leaving a lot of fat and sugar energy in the bloodstream, increasing inflammation, causing fatty liver, increasing fat synthesis in the liver, increasing insulin levels that leads to obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, higher risks of strokes, dementia. Hmm. So there is a paradox that is created in which we are saying to lower LDL levels, you need to eat in a certain way, and that's going to cause insulin resistance. On the other hand, if you give up the idea that LDL is bad, you're going to eat the way we were designed to eat, which is a low-carb, relatively high-fat diet. And this is what is going to lead to lower insulin levels, clearing of the fat energy from the bloodstream. And the lower insulin levels are going to help you see leptin. The brain can see leptin, so you're not going to overeat. Right. Just to interject here, leptin is the hunger satiation hormone, right? So your your brain sees leptin rise when you're satisfied and tells you to stop eating. Yes. Or something like that. The receptor goes into your brain, I think, and tells you to stop eating. That is correct. Leptin is an important energy regulation hormone that our brain utilizes to see how much we need to eat. Mm. The important studies that have been done by several researchers point out that when your insulin levels are high, the brain cannot see leptin. Right. So high insulin levels make your brain think that you're starving and it makes you eat. And that's the sensation we've all had after eating an entire pizza. Your stomach is full and yet you want to eat more. You think you're starving. I couldn't agree more. I've had that sensation several times before until I adopted to this way of thinking about five years ago. Okay. We were discussing about giving up on thinking that LDL is necessarily bad and that will permit us to eat in the right way. And eating in the right way is going to permit you to reduce your insulin levels and clear the fat energy from the bloodstream. So when we eat this way, eating more fat, eating lower carbs, uh, it's not uncommon for people's LDL numbers to rise. And what's going on there? The reason that's happening is that the body becomes very efficient at using fat energy. And so the fat energy that you eat is either immediately utilized for oxidation, which means to burn, or it is packed into the fat cells. And when that happens, the father of LDL, which is the VLDL, Mm. gets converted to LDL. Now, I want to take a minute out here and say that there's been a little controversy recently because Dave Feldman, uh, the Uh, important innovator of the inversion pattern, the lean mass hyper responders, Hmm. 
recently gave a podcast uh, with a very esteemed physician, Dr. Peter Atia. Right. In and in that podcast, there was a little doubt thrown in whether the rise in LDL is because of an increased production of VLDL. So in other words, the liver is putting out more VLDL because it needs to traffic a lot of fat energy since you're not eating carbs, except that that VLDL is now getting converted to LDL very quickly. And that's why your LDL levels are increasing is the primary hypothesis that um, an energy delivery model that Dave Feldman is promoting comes from. Okay. However, Probably the situation is not as simplistic as that. And the VLDL export, in other words, the amount of VLDL that you're putting out in a person on a low-carb, high-fat diet, it's probably increased or about the same as a person eating a carbohydrate diet. But the reason your LDL is going up is probably twofold. Number one is that the VLDL is being cleared a lot quicker because you are efficient at taking away the fat energy immediately since you are insulin sensitive. And by clearing, you mean the the fat cells are taking up the triglyceride from the LDL particle? Correct. And not only are the fat cells taking up the triglycerides, but the muscle cells are taking it up for oxidation, which means to use it as fuel. Okay. And the other part is possibly that the liver puts out a LDL particle all by itself because it doesn't need to transport as much fat energy as it did before. And I need to unpack that a little bit, if I may. Yes. And and the reason is that when you are burning fat, there are many things that the liver does when it picks up fat from the bloodstream. So like, for example, if somebody is burning fat, they are undergoing what is called lipolysis. Lipolysis means that the fat cells are releasing triglycerides into the bloodstream by breaking the triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol molecule. Right. So the liver is picking up this fatty acids, which is part of the triglyceride, from the fat cells and then converting portions of them to ketone bodies. So that is an important thing for people to understand because... Fat energy taken up by the liver is converted to small molecules, which are ketone bodies, which are sugar-like molecules. Yeah, they're water-soluble. And they're water-soluble. They dissolve in bloodstream. So the liver is putting out fat energy a lot more when you are on a low-carb diet than it did before, Mm. except that it is not all as VLDL triglycerides. It's coming also as ketone bodies. Ah. And some of the fatty acids can be burned directly in oxidation by the muscle cells. So in a sense, what Dr. Atia said was just partially right, which is that the VLDL, which is the way the liver is transporting fat energy, may not increase or decrease as much, except that more of the VLDL is getting converted to LDL now, since the time the VLDL stays in circulation is very short. All right. You are burning it up right away. Right. So that is an important distinction to make. Another fascinating thing that most people don't recognize is that let's take the situation of fasting. Okay. So, and fasting is a fascinating situation because in this uh, uh, situation, you're not eating any calories. And since you're not eating any calories, you're going to run out of carbohydrate sources within half a day. Right. So the body is not predominantly dependent on burning fat. And it's burning fat by burning fatty acids. It's burning fat by converting the fatty acids to ketones. And the fatty acids are coming from the fat cells, which are releasing that energy into the blood, right? Exactly. Because the fat cells are now shrinking since they have to release fat energy for the person to survive, right? Uh, for the person to use for energy. 
So in this situation, the all three things are happening. One is that you're using fat cells. Number two, you're using ketone bodies. And number three is that the fat energy put out by the liver as VLDL is being rapidly converted to LDL. Right. So your LDL levels are going to go up. But another fascinating thing that people don't recognize is that there is down regulation. And I want to say it with effect, there's down regulation of the LDL receptor on the liver. Okay. First of all, down regulation means a reduction. A reduction, yes. So there are these receptors on the liver that pick up the LDL from the circulation and they reduce the amount of LDL in the circulation. Mm -hmm. Here is a situation in which you're fasting. Fasting is beneficial for our health. And studies show that when people who are healthy, otherwise metabolically normal, their LDL level goes up by 70%. When they fast. That's right, when they fast. So yeah. how can body be doing something during fasting that increases your risks of heart disease? Right. First of all, it <laughs> cannot. That's kind of silly. And the second thing is that if LDL were bad, the body should start picking up the LDL by increasing the number of receptors on the liver to take away the LDL from circulation. Right. On the other hand, it is down-regulating. It is reducing those receptors. And I get it. Is It's reducing them because it needs the energy to travel to the cells that need it, right? Uh, that's possibly absolutely correct. And another reason why it may reduce the LDL receptors is because in a fasting state, the body is in a conservation mode. It's mm. not in a growth mode. And a cell needs cholesterol for tissue repair, for multiplication, for growth. So when you are in a growth state, let's take a situation of pregnancy or teenage years when you're actually growing. Mm. In that situation, you want high insulin levels because high insulin levels are anabolic. They cause growth. If you take liver cells and you soak them with insulin, mm. the amount of LDL receptor goes up because the liver cells want to take the cholesterol from the circulation so that they can grow, so that tissue can grow. Cholesterol is absolutely needed by every cell. It's needed for tissue repair. Okay. Another way of saying that this is a highly regulated system and to just focus on LDL as bad without evaluating how the body controls cholesterol metabolism, lipoprotein metabolism is fundamentally wrong. Okay, so you and I know this and it's going to take some time before the rest of the world catches up with this. It's kind of no surprise that some of your colleagues think you're crazy. <laughs> Because you're going against conventional wisdom. How, have, how, how has that manifested itself in your life? Oh, it's, uh, it's very discouraging because um, I think that I am out there to tell my colleagues that we go through this wonderful training. We perhaps understand human biology, human physiology much better than anyone else. And using this training... What we are doing is that we are medicalizing our profession. So in other words, if I take myself back five years from now, when a patient would come to me, my thought process would be like this, is that you have this problem. What drug can I use to improve your life? Right. It does seem like every doctor visit ends in a prescription. And that's correct. We are losing the ability to use all the knowledge that we have gained to improve people's health through nutrition, through fasting, through exercise. It seems that we are not able to delay our gratification for improved health through lifestyle means. And we would want to write in a prescription because it's so much easier, so much faster, so much quicker. Yeah. And I would say that the the backlash I've heard from doctors is, well, I can tell my patients to, you know, to lose weight and to exercise and to do all those things. And they just don't. They won't. So I've given up. And here, just take this prescription. At least something will come of it. Are you seeing that as well, that doctors have little faith in their patients' ability to follow um, lifestyle change? And, and, and that is accurate. But I think 
one of the reasons for that is that they are failing to recognize that they're giving bad nutritional advice. Yeah, either that or they believe the standard of nutritional advice, which is wrong. That's right. Uh, so there has to be an education from people like you, uh, from other organizations that have to explain that we have been giving all the entire world the wrong nutritional advice of a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet, which is designed for failure. And let's face it, not all that tasty. I mean, when, when I, I, I can win anybody over to the ketogenic diet just by inviting them for dinner, and I'll blow their minds. And they're like, are you kidding me? I can eat like this and get healthy? People just, you know, it's not difficult if done right. They are scared of eating like that. That yeah. is number one. And I think in many ways, the human brain is designed like that of a capuchin monkey. <laughs> and and <laughs> right, r right here in my neighborhood is uh, Mr. Monkey's Emporium, which is a coffee shop, beautiful coffee shop. And he keeps capuchin monkeys out there. The capuchin monkeys have the rare ability to be able to eat their entire body weight in sugar. They, they absolutely love sugar. Yeah. And I think the human brain has a weakness for sugar, for sweet things. because Oh, definitely. And, and, and that's what gets people addicted towards the modern way of eating, the, the prescribed way of eating from mm. all the major uh, associations that give nutritional guidelines. Yeah. So before we wrap this up, I want to talk about your event that's happening uh, later this week at the University of Houston and um, how people can join online. Uh, thank you, Carl. And I want to do a little bit of uh, shameless promotion out here. Um, the event is right next to NASA, which is the uh, premier space agency uh, in Houston. Mm -hmm. And it is on the shores of Clear Lake. So you have beautiful water body right uh, next to the event. Uh, the location is University of Houston Clear Lake campus. And there are 19 speakers, uh, speakers from all over the world, uh, yourself included. Uh, there is Marianne DeMassey coming from Australia. There is Dr. Andreas Einfeld coming from Sweden. Mm. There is Ivor Cummins coming from Ireland. Mm -hmm. And Megan Ramos coming from Canada. Yeah. And the amazing part is that all of these people are doing it out of the goodness of their heart. So great. Because this is a first time event. I'm not able to give them an honorarium. Mm -hmm. And these people are coming for the health of Houston. Houston has a rare distinction of being in the top 10 in terms of obesity, diabetes, insulin resistance, heart disease, you name any of the chronic diseases. Hmm. And an event like this is very important for the health of the local population. So you've invited me to come down and do a live stream of it, like we did at Keto Fest, and you're selling tickets to that live stream. How can people get there? So the Tickets are available on lowcarbhouston.com. When you put lowcarbhouston.com, you will see a live stream uh, button. You click on it and you can get live stream tickets right away. And Carl is an exceptional live stream broadcaster because you have seen his live stream at Keto Fest. And uh, we are actually honored and blessed to have him do that for us. Well, thank you. And as another bonus this week, we're going to release your talk from Keto Fest 2018 along with this podcast. So if you go to the show notes, you'll see the URL, or you could just go to nadir.ketofest.com. And that will bring you right to the YouTube video of your talk at Keto Fest, which was great. Well, thank you, Carl. I was extremely nervous in that talk. Uh, I wanted it to come out right. And then when I look back at it, I think, uh, and it's again me promoting it, it's probably one of the best talks I've ever given. That's great. Thank you, Nadir. Thanks for everything. And uh, hey, I'll see you on uh, Thursday night. Awesome. Look forward to some Texas barbecue with you, Carl. Absolutely. <laughs> Bring it on. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care. Could you say y'all do Oh, man, I'm so looking forward to going down to Houston this weekend. Yeah. So you're going down to film 
uh, some of that uh, conference, right? Yeah, that's right. I'm going to live stream and record the whole thing on video. Nice. And uh, and I get to hang out with Ivor and all the other guys down there, and it's going to be great. Yeah. So the awesome thing about all these cardiologists coming out, I'm thinking, you know, Dr. Kaplan in Australia, he's like mm-hmm. the Australian Asim Malotra, and then, of course, Asim Malotra. Mm-hmm. And uh, Nadir Ali is that these guys are right at the at the crux of the issue. And so right. these are the leaders in the cardiology community who are the, like just at the beginning of the transfer of the cardiology community. And these guys have uh, influence amongst their peers. And uh, right. this is a very important aspect. So this is awesome. I agree. More cardiologists getting on the keto bandwagon is what we need. Because like I've always said, this cholesterol idea is the sort of the last frontier of, you know, mind changing that needs to happen in order for the ketogenic diet to be widely accepted in the mainstream. Because that's the thing that everybody thinks is that you're going to clog your arteries, you know, you're going to kill yourself. Oh, yeah. 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 It's just not true. Yeah. Uh, Well, I think it's time for some food. How about some recipes? (laughs) You okay there, buddy? (laughs) I think I strained something. (laughs) <laughs> I think I popped a freckle. <laughs> okay. What you got, Carl? Well, like I said, I did a smoked lamb this week, and uh, it's already cut up into portions and put in vacuum-sealed bags and frozen nice. and ready for the sous vide whenever I feel like having some. But that's not the best part. The best part was actually this keto hummus tahini that I made. Mm. Now, I've talked about my Kali mash before, right? Yep. The Kali mash that I do, instead of steaming or boiling cauliflower, <laughs> terrible idea. Don't ever do that. <laughs> Why would you no, do that to a vegetable? What an awful thing to do to a vegetable. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah. You, you must roast it in olive oil and spices and mm. salt and pepper. And that's what I did. And so that became the base of my hummus tahini instead of chickpeas. And, you know, chickpeas, Mm. while lower in carbs than, say, potatoes, they are still kind of carby. Yeah, yeah. But the key to making hummus is to use good tahini paste. And tahini is like like sesame seed peanut butter. It's kind of what it it is. That's it, yeah. Yeah. Ground down sesame seeds. It's like sesame seed butter, right? So with the right spices and all of this stuff, it it just comes out so good. And, you know, there are some carbs in it because, you know, tahini does have a little carbs and some garlic and there's olives and not, not much, but you know, you, you're not going to, you're not going to eat this like you're going to eat mashed potatoes or, you know, collie mash, but it's hummus. So if you eat some lamb or something like that, some Mediterranean food, just put a little schmear on the plate underneath everything and it's going to be delicious so here you go you need a head of cauliflower chopped up it's about half a kilo Mm -hmm. you need about uh, 60 grams of tahini paste maybe about two or three tablespoons i'm not sure what that works out to you need a bulb of garlic broken up because here's the here's the best thing about roasting cauliflower you put whole garlic cloves in there to roast with the cauliflower oh it, yeah roast garlic roasted garlic Yum. and it yeah it takes all the harshness out of the garlic and it also mm. tames down the garlic flavor a little bit so you're going to roast most of it and keep one garlic clove fresh all right okay so you need about 8 tablespoons of olive oil extra virgin of course you need mm-hmm. about 100 grams of Kalamata olives, maybe a quarter cup to a half cup. You decide. A teaspoon of paprika, a teaspoon of cumin, a tablespoon of chopped parsley. I actually put a little more chopped parsley in there because that's a really good flavor. Yeah. And you need the juice of one lemon. That's a classic combine. Lemon, parsley, and garlic. Yeah. All right, that sounds delicious. That's the Mediterranean mm. flavor profile right there. Yeah, yeah. Add some olive oil, ba-boom. All right, so you pre- yeah. <laughs> preheat the oven to 300 Fahrenheit or about a 150 Celsius. Mm-hmm. You want to crush the garlic cloves with your palm or you can use a knife or whatever, however you want to remove the skin. But I like to crush the garlic clove just to break it open and release all that stuff inside. Right. So now you're going to chop the cauliflower into pieces, place that on a cookie sheet with the garlic cloves except for one. Mm -hmm. and the olive oil, and you're going to sprinkle the cumin and paprika on top. 
Now notice you're not going to add salt to this because we have olives going in there. Mm -hmm. So after you put it all together, if it still needs salt, then you add salt. Okay. Right. So you're going to roast the garlic and the cauliflower in the oven until browning around the edges, about 40 minutes. You don't want it too dark. And here's what happens if it's too dark. The end product kind of looks like, well, you know what I mean. Kind of looks <laughs> unappetizing. Nasty. Yeah. yeah. It's going to taste delicious because it's going to be roasted <laughs> and crispy bits and stuff. But just, just roast it until it gets a little brown. That's fine. So now you remove it from the oven and let it cool down because you're going to put it in a food processor with all the remaining ingredients. And if it's too hot, uh, everything will just explode. Unless you leave, you know, the, the it vented, which is possible to do with a food processor. So you combine all the ingredients together and that last one bulb of fresh garlic, because you want a little bite, in the food processor and combine that until smooth and silky. And you really do need to work it. You really need to keep trying it after you know, every 30 seconds. And then it's done. And if you were going to eat a mezza plate, you know, mm -hmm. you would have yeah. your hummus in a bowl in a swirl pattern with olive oil in the middle and sure. paprika sprinkled on top. And that would come traditionally with pita and olives and all of the other great things that go along with that. Eggplant. Yeah. yeah, just ditch the pita, or you could use the ones from Keto & Co. They have really good flatbread. Oh, yeah, that's right. They do. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, enjoy that with your lamb or other Mediterranean foods, and uh, that it's wonderful stuff. Nice. So that's my recipe. What you got? This is a recipe that I added as a side last week. That's my whole egg noodles. Oh, yeah. And I'm just going to go through the technique for using those, and we'll put the recipe up. My recipe is really going to be a sauce that you can use for any kind of egg dish. Oh. The idea of the whole egg noodles is you use them anywhere that you'd use, say, a cooked fettuccine. Uh, so you could use it with a bolognese, or you could right. use it with a vegetarian stir fry like I did last week, mm -hmm. or you could just fold them in a pesto sauce mm. you know and so the way that you do these eggs you essentially i mean for for two people you're going to use about four eggs and you're going to use about a teaspoon of salt and you're going to use about a teaspoon of ghee so you're going to start off you're going to break four eggs into a bowl and whisk them until the eggs are homogeneous so you don't mm -hmm. see any whites you don't see any yolks yep i like to whisk it until the mixture is nice and light so i like to get some air into it you could use a stand mixer if you want, right? You could use a stand mixer. I like to do it by hand only because I like to stop as soon as it gets to where it needs to be. Right. With a stand mixer, I tend to go a little bit over and then I, you know, I run the risk of, uh, of curdling. Sure. I start off now with a hot pan. I'm going to put a pan on the range and I'm going to put a teaspoon of ghee in and I'm going to melt that down. And then I put my eggs into a Pyrex jar, which, which has a lip so that I can pour it. Because mm -hmm. what I'm going to do is I'm going to be pouring in just enough egg to coat the surface of the pan. And when you start off, there's still a lot of ghee that's melted in there, so it's quite liquid. And I'm going to pick up the pan. I'm going to swirl it around until I get I'm, – I'm just perfectly coating the surface of the pan. It's, as you said last week, it's a little bit like a crepe. Right. What I do is I tap them each. I only cook one half of the of the egg. I just basically cook it until the top of the egg goes dry, and then I tap it out on a, on a chopping board. And I just do this. This is a production assembly, but the entire thing takes about five minutes to make two big plates of noodles for two people. So, nice. Yeah, you, ca you can't get better than that. And I just tap them out on a plate, basically building up a stack of these crepes, and then I fold them over and slice them with a knife, and that gets me my fettuccine. So here's the sauce that I use, and this is based on a hot sauce I got from Low Carb Emporium, which is a, a, a service in Australia that will mail you out uh, low-carb foods. And they had this pickled capsicum, pickled bell pepper. And I did a recipe once from uh, somebody's website on how to make you know, pickled capsicum. But there's actually an easier way to do this, and it requires a bit of a hack. I start off with kimchi. You know what kimchi is? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, it's a fermented Korean cabbage, very hot. That's it. That's it. They use peppers to get it hot. Yeah. So what I do is I take some melted butter or melted ghee, probably about a tablespoon of that, and then I put into a magic bullet or a little mini blender, I put a tablespoon of that oil and about three or four tablespoons of kimchi, and I blitz it. Yeah. And the sauce is absolutely delicious. You know, it must be very deep flavor-wise. 
Yeah, it's so complex. Yeah. Yeah, kimchi is a spectacular flavor. Each different morsel that you eat is going to have a slightly different taste because sometimes you're tasting cabbage or sometimes you're tasting different vegetables. And right. so, so it's, it's a heterogeneous taste. But when you blitz it all down, it becomes homogeneous. And the actual flavor, that with melted butter, delicious put a schmear of that over some eggs any kind of eggs you can put them over these you can toss these egg noodles that i make in this sauce and there's a meal right there and that's a vegetarian meal too (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome so that's what i've got fantastic wow that's a great show and uh, i'd like to thank nadir ali and you can go see his keto fest presentation at nadir.ketofest.com and definitely go to the Low Carb Houston Conference, at least online. Get your live ticket mm-hmm. and check it out. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah. Of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute anything we've said, send it by email to dudes at 2ketodudes.com or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram at 2ketodudes. Make sure to use the hashtag 2ketodudes. And, of course, if you want to join the free ketogenic forum, it's forum.2keto.com. And you can have a look around the forum without needing to create an account by starting with success.2keto.com. And if useless swag is your fancy, like T-shirts, coffee mugs, and other junk with witty keto sayings on them, (laughs) head over to gear.2keto.com. Interestingly enough, at this conference, I've had three people come up to me wearing Two Keto Dudes t-shirts and saying, look, I'm wearing your t-shirt. <laughs> That's so cool. And you know where they got them from? Gear.2keto.com. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want a shot at getting some of that swag for free, join the Two Keto Dudes fan club. You'll be eligible to win something in every show. Go to fanclub.2keto.com. And if you feel like supporting our forums and all the podcasts we produce, including Two Keto Dudes, Keto Woman with Daisy Brackenhall, Keto Families, Keto Kids and the Obesity Code podcast with Jason Fung and Megan Ramos think about making a monthly pledge on our Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com You can also see all of our podcasts and other videos on YouTube at youtube.2keto.com And if you haven't already, go leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That's how new people get to know about what we do. Two Keto Dudes is brought to you by Two Keto LLC, who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. And Richard, keep calm and keto on. Yeah, keep calm, keto on, Carl. And you can fast as well if you want to. Absolutely. And we'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Dudes.